So this video is on the mean value theorem. This video is intended to be watched after the video on Rolle's theorem in the playlist on real analysis because the mean value theorem is really just a generalized version of Rolle's theorem and the proof of the mean value theorem is really simple as long as we know Rolle's theorem. It comes very quickly from Rolle's theorem. So this video starts with the prerequisite that you know Rolle's theorem, you believe Rolle's theorem and you've seen a proof of Rolle's theorem. So the mean value theorem starts with similar criteria to Rolle's theorem. So we're going to have a function which we'll call f. The domain is a closed interval from a to b, and it's a real valued function. And we're going to assume that the function is continuous on the entire closed interval from a to b, and differentiable on the open interval from a to b. These are the weakest criteria that we need to be true in order to be able to apply this theorem. Now there's one criterion that was here for Rolle's theorem that we're getting rid of now in the mean value theorem, and that's how the mean value theorem is a generalization. So in Rolle's theorem, we insisted that the value of the function at the endpoints a and b was equal. We're not going to insist on that for the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem is then that if you have a function that satisfies these criteria, you can conclude this, that there exists a c within the open interval a, b, so properly in between a and b, such that if you look at the derivative of the function at c, it is equal to this f of b minus f of a, so the difference in the function f as you go from a all the way to b, divided by the change that you make in the domain, which is b minus a. And you can see that if f of b and f of a were equal to one another, as they were in the criteria for Rolle's theorem, then this numerator is zero. So this becomes Rolle's theorem that there is a point in the open interval a, b, such that the derivative is equal to zero. So that's why this is a generalization of Rolle's theorem, because for the case where f of b and f of a are not equal to one another, this more complicated thing is going to hold true. So intuitively on a picture, this is what the mean value theorem is saying. So here we have our interval a, b. In white here, this is representing our function plotted. So you can see that this is the value of the function at a, and this is the value of the function at b, and they are now not equal to one another. And then if you connect these two points, so a, f of a, to b, f of b, with a secant line like so, the gradient of that secant line is going to be the change in f divided by the change in the domain. So the change in the value of the function is f of b minus f of a. That's the height of the triangle here. And the horizontal uh, length of the triangle here is going to be the value b minus the value a. So the gradient of that line is then going to be this divided by this, which is what we have here. So what this theorem is intuitively saying is that somewhere inside the interval here, there must exist a point C where the derivative is the same as the gradient of this secant line, i.e. the gradient of the tangent line at that point C is going to be parallel, the same as the gradient of this secant line. And that's what I've sort of shown here. Here is a point where the tangent is going to be parallel to this, have the same value as this. So that's what the mean value theorem is saying, that there will exist a point C such that its gradient at that point, its derivative at that point, is the same as the gradient of the secant line connecting this point to this point. So you can see on the picture how this is a generalization of Rolle's theorem as well, because in Rolle's theorem, this height is going to equal the same as this height. So the secant line connecting the two points in that case is going to be a horizontal straight line, i.e., it will have gradient zero. So the mean value theorem would then say that there exists a C inside the interval a, b, such that it's going to have that same gradient as that secant line, i.e. it's going to have gradient equal to zero, but that is, of course, Rolle's theorem. So this really is just a generalization of Rolle's theorem to the case where f of a and f of b are not equal to one another. So the proof of this theorem is extremely simple using Rolle's theorem. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and turn our function f into something that we can apply Rolle's theorem to. And the way we're going to do that is by creating another function on our interval a, b, which we'll call the function g, which we're then going to subtract from our function f to get a function f minus g. And then that function is going to be something that we can apply Rolle's theorem to. So our function g is going to be cleverly picked. It's going to be a very simple function. It's going to be this straight line function, this secant line that we have connecting the point a, f of a to b, f of b. I'm going to create a function that would have that straight line as its graph. So that's what I've done here. So 
we know the gradient of this secant line is going to be given by this, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So here is the gradient I've got here, and then I just need to make sure that my function goes through one of the points on this line. Then if it goes through one of the points and it has the correct gradient, it will be my desired function. So the point that I'm going to choose to make sure it goes through is a f of a. So I put in that I'm going to multiply this by x minus a here, and then I add on f of a here. So this is basic equations of a straight line graph. So you can see that if I put in a now into my formula here, a here subtract a makes zero. So all of this bit goes, and we get f of a. So it correctly goes through this point. And you can see that if you multiply this all out, you'll get this bit, which will be this gradient times your variable x. Then you'll get minus a times this, which is just some constant, plus f of a, so it will have this as its gradient, and then it will have some complicated constant term. So it will have gradient equal to this is the important bit. So it goes through this point, and it has gradient equal to this, ergo it is that straight line. So my function g is clearly going to be continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b, because it's a linear function, it's a straight line function. So clearly, if you take any point in here, the limit of the function as x approaches that point is going to equal the value of the function at that point. It's also going to be differentiable everywhere on the open interval a, b, because if you go again to any point and consider connecting it to another point by a secant line, those secant lines are all going to be parallel to one another. They're all going to have gradient equal to the gradient of the straight line itself. So when you take the limit of them as h approaches zero, it's still going to equal that same value, which is the gradient of the straight line, which is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So we can conclude that g prime of x is equal to this for all x on the open interval a, b. What we're then going to do is construct a third function on our interval a, b, which is going to be the function f of x minus g of x. And I've shown why this is such a good idea using our picture example here. So in the case of our picture example, we're going to take the value of the function, which is here in white, and we're going to subtract off the value of our g function, which is in blue here. So clearly you're going to get something that's going to look like this now, defined on your interval a, b. And the crucial thing is that the value of the function at a is going to equal zero, and the value of the function at b is going to equal zero, because the value of the function f and the value of the function g were the same at both a and b. That means that this third function is going to be something that we're going to be able to apply Rolle's theorem to. There are, of course, a few more technicalities that we need to check in order to be able to apply Rolle's theorem to this third function. So we need to check that it's going to be continuous everywhere on the closed interval from A to B, and we need to check that it's going to be differentiable everywhere on the open interval A, B. So let's start with continuity. So we know that f and g are continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b. Because g is continuous on that closed interval, we know that negative 1 times g is going to be continuous everywhere on the closed interval a, b. Because it's, negative 1 is just a real number, and we know that if we take a continuous function, multiply it by a real number, the new function that we get is still going to be continuous. So minus g is going to be continuous everywhere on our interval. And then we're just adding two continuous functions together. We're adding f of x to minus g of x. And again, we know that if we add two continuous functions together, we'll end up with another continuous function. So we can conclude, therefore, that f of x minus g of x is going to be continuous everywhere on the closed interval a and b. So now on to differentiability. So we need to know that it's going to be differentiable everywhere on the open interval a, b. And what we currently know is that f is differentiable everywhere on this open interval, and g is differentiable everywhere on the open interval. So we need actually to know that if we take a multiple, uh, a real number multiple of a differentiable function, that it's still differentiable. And we also need to know that if we add two differentiable functions together, that it's going to be differentiable. So we haven't actually shown this at any point previously in our playlist on real analysis, so we'll do this briefly now. So we'll do the multiple first. So we'll assume that g is differentiable everywhere on our open interval from a to b, and what we want to show is that lambda times g, where lambda is some real number, is also going to be differentiable everywhere on the open interval a, b. So take a general point x inside our interval a, b. If it's going to be differentiable at that point, then it means this limit needs to exist. And if it exists, we'll call it the derivative of lambda g. 
So the limit as h approaches zero of our function lambda g at x plus h, which is just lambda times g at x plus h, minus the value of our function at x, which is lambda times g of x, divided by h. So we need to know that this limit exists. Now what we currently know is that the equivalent limit for g is going to exist. So I've written that down over here. So the limit as h approaches 0 of g x plus h minus g of x divided by h, this is going to exist and indeed it's going to equal g prime. But now consider multiplying that limit by lambda. By the algebra of limits, this will then equal this thing. You can bring the lambda inside here and then just basic algebra, multiply both these two things by it, and you'll then get this. So because this exists and the algebra of limits is true, we can then conclude that this is actually equal to this. Therefore, it is going to exist. And even better, we know exactly what it's going to equal. It's going to equal lambda times this one. I, it's going to equal lambda times g prime. So we have shown that if g is differentiable on our interval a, b, then lambda g is going to be differentiable, and indeed its derivative is just going to be lambda times the derivative of g, so lambda g prime. Now let's take f and g that are differentiable on our interval a, b, and let's show that we can construct a third function by adding the two together, f plus g, and this is going to be differentiable on our open interval a, b. So again, take a general point x inside the interval a, b, and if the function is going to be differentiable there, then this limit must exist. So the limit as h approaches 0 of our function evaluated at x plus h, so that is f of x plus h plus g of x plus h, subtract the function evaluated at x, which is f of x plus g of x, and then divided by h. Now we know from the fact that f and g are differentiable everywhere on the interval a, b, that they're differentiable at our general point x, so we know these limits both exist. So the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h, this must exist because f is differentiable at x, and the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h, this must exist because g is differentiable at x. But now, by the algebra of limits, we can consider what this plus this is equal to, and you can combine those together into one limit, so you'll get limit as h approaches 0 of this plus this. They're over the same denominator, so you can combine them together, so you'll combine all of these things in the numerator together, and hopefully you can appreciate that these two can be grouped together into this, and then these two, which both have a minus sign in front of them, they can have that minus sign factored out, and then you'll have them grouped together like so. So this these two things added together will become this by the algebra of limits. Therefore, this thing we can conclude must exist, and it's equal to the value of this one plus the value of this one. So f plus g is going to be differentiable, and its derivative is going to be f prime plus g prime. So end of the sidetrack then now, we can conclude that this thing, f of x minus g of x, is going to be differentiable everywhere on our open interval a, b, because minus g of x is going to be differentiable by this, and then we can add two differentiable functions together, and we'll still end up with something that's differentiable. And that's what we've done here, we've added f of x to minus g of x. So I've written the function f of x minus g of x out in full here. So it's f of x minus, and then I've substituted in what g of x is equal to. It's equal to this thing up here. So we've got minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a times x minus a. And then I've also got minus that bit on the end, which is f of a. Now, we have all the criteria that are necessary in order for us to be able to apply Rolle's theorem to this function. It's continuous on the closed interval a, b, it's differentiable on the open interval a, b, and the values of the function at the end point are both equal to one another. So by Rolle's theorem, I can conclude that for this function, there will exist a c in between a and b, such that the derivative of the function is equal to zero at that c. But now we can think about what the derivative of this function actually is equal to. What is the derivative of f of x minus g of x? f of x minus g of x prime, as I've written here. So we can use these results here. This is just equal to f of x plus minus g of x. Therefore, its derivative is going to equal the derivative of f, so f prime, plus the derivative of negative g of x. We can use this result now. Minus 1 is a lambda. It's a real number. So the derivative then of minus g of x is just going to equal minus the derivative of g. We know that the derivative of g, g was a straight line, remember, a linear function, its derivative was equal to this, so the derivative of minus g of x is just going to equal the minus of that. 
So overall, our derivative is going to equal f prime of x plus minus this thing. So now I know there exists a c between a and b where the derivative of this thing is equal to zero. So that means that this, evaluated at some c, must equal zero. So putting in c now, f prime at c minus, now this thing doesn't actually have a variable, so it's just a constant, so minus this thing must equal zero. So therefore, just rearranging this, what I can conclude is that at this point c, where the derivative of this function, f of x minus g of x, is equal to zero, the derivative of my original function f is going to equal the gradient of that secant line connecting at the point a f of a to b f of b. So this c that I found here is going to be the magic c that is going to work up here and give me a gradient of the original function that is the same as the gradient of this secant line. So that then completes the proof of the mean value theorem. Thank you for watching.